Hello, and welcome to Our Legacy with Icons. I am Kim Jones, and today we are going to be talking about Title IX, the Biden administration's proposed changes that remove sex-based protections for women, and how women are fighting some of the same battles today that they thought they had won 50 years ago. We have two amazing people uh, joining us. The first is uh, Jennifer Braceres. Jennifer is the director of the Independent Women's Law Center, a former member of the United States Commission on Civil Rights. Jennifer is an expert on Title IX. Um, she has taught courses on civil rights and constitutional law at both Boston College Law School and Suffolk University Law School. She writes and speaks widely on issues related to civil rights, civil liberties, and other aspects of constitutional law. Jennifer is a graduate of the Harvard Law School, where she served as an editor of the Law Review. After law school, she clerked for two federal judges and practiced labor and employment law with the Boston law firm Ropes and Gray. A longtime political columnist and editor, Jennifer's writing has appeared in a variety of publications, including the Wall Street Journal, the Boston Globe, the Hill, and the National Review Online. With a background in both media and law, Jennifer has a unique talent for breaking down complex legal, top legal topics for a general audience. Thank you for being here with us, Jennifer. And we are also joined by Dr. Mary O'Connor. Dr. O'Connor is a physician and a former Olympian in rowing. She has one of the most interesting stories in the history of Title IX as a participant in what is considered the first stand for women's equity in college athletics. Dr. O'Connor is co-founder and chief medical officer for Vori Health. Am I saying that right? Yes. Okay. Correct. Thank you. A physician-led virtual musculoskeletal company. She is a nationally recognized leader in health equity, chairing the Movement is Life Caucus, a nonprofit multi-stakeholder coalition committed to, committed to addressing musculoskeletal health disparities um, since its inception in 2010. She has long championed diversity and inclusion in orthopedics and broken many barriers to women in this overwhelmingly male profession. Thank you, both of you. Um, Jennifer, let's start with you, please. Uh, can you give us just a background on Title IX, its legal history, and what it has done for women so far today? Sure. Um, a lot of people think of Title IX as a sports law, or um, some people think of it as a women's clothing catalog. Um, <laughs> but what it actually is, is a simple federal law that prohibits discrimination in education. That's it. Um, it prohibits discrimination on the basis of sex in any educational program or activity that receives federal money. And that means almost all of them. So, of course, public schools receive federal money, but almost all private universities receive federal money as well. Um, and the statute applies not just to the educational programs themselves, the courses, but to all aspects of the educational experience, that's where athletics come in. So clubs, uh, teams, uh, dorm rooms, um, study abroad programs, right? Anything to do with the educational experience. Um, if, the, if the school takes one drop of federal money, they are covered by Title IX and therefore they are prohibited from discriminating on the basis of sex. Now, what that was thought to mean uh, at the time the statute was passed in 1972 was that you couldn't you couldn't treat men and women differently um, in cases where those differences are irrelevant. So, for example, you couldn't say, "Well, you know, all the girls are going to take home ec and the boys are going to take wood shop." No, the classes have to be open to anybody. Um, and in terms of sports, uh, after the statute was passed, the Department of Education uh, passed a regulation uh, specifically addressing athletics. And in that case, they the, the department made it clear that the schools had to provide equal athletic opportunities for members of both sexes. That's the wording of the regulation, members of both sexes. Mm -hmm. So, um, in the world of sports, that almost requires the creation of single sex teams exclusively for women because you can't, as a school, say, 
Oh, well, we, we, we provide equal athletic opportunities for both sexes. Anybody can try out for the football team. Uh-huh. Anybody can try out for the, the soccer team. It's, it's, it's an equal opportunity. No, that wouldn't be equal, actually, because the reality, when you consider biology, is that the average man is bigger, faster, stronger than the average woman. And so um, in the case of, of athletics in particular, the regulations contemplated the creation of, of separate teams. So separate but equal, right? You have to have equal number of spots, basically, for female athletes and male athletes. And um, Mary will talk about this, but you have to treat them the same. You can't give male athletes a locker room and not give female athletes a locker room, right? Because that's disparate, unequal, unfair treatment. Mm-hmm. So that's that's sort of the general overview. Okay. How about for things like scholarships for STEM or for uh, medical school, would it apply to those areas as well? So it does apply to all those areas. And, and in the, uh, you know, with the passage of Title IX, what you saw is, um, you know, you couldn't have single sex medical schools or law schools or things like that. You had to allow women to uh, participate in those programs. It doesn't mean you have to have an equal number of men and women in med school or an equal number of men and women uh, in the engineering program, because unlike sports, which are physical uh, and biological, mm-hmm. you know, ed- academic um, enterprises are intellectual, right? And, and there are choices made about what people want to study. And so if you have an engineering program that's 60% male, that doesn't violate the statute by any means. Um, you just have to allow women to, to apply to these programs. Now, what's actually happened in the advent of Title IX is that we are now at the point where um, women are the vast majority of recipients of bachelor degrees, of master's degrees, of PhDs. And in recent years, they've become a slim majority of of students in med school and in law school. Oh, interesting. Um, Yeah, I think you still see certain areas, engineering, maybe MBAs that might still tend to be slightly male dominated, but in almost every aspect of education, um, women are succeeding, women are excelling, and frankly, women are are crushing men academically um, in terms of their grades, their um, their advanced degrees, all of those things. The average the average woman is much better educated because these opportunities were open to them. And when they were allowed to take them, they were able to do great things. Okay. I did hear that women are something like 60% of the incoming freshman class at, in universities right now. Is that, does that, do you know that? Um, that, that, that is, that is true at some schools that do, some schools. some schools kind of try to gender balance in their admissions. Um, and the schools that do not have quote unquote affirmative action for men do tend to be 60% female. Um, I think Boston University is one of them. Providence mm-hmm. College is one of them. University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, I think is close to 60% female. Um, it's not, it's not the norm because most schools do try to balance it out a little bit in their admissions, but, but if they didn't make that effort, I mean, women on average are just frankly better qualified. (laughs) They are. I mean, you can look at the statistics. The statistics. Okay. All right. So 50 years later, women are excelling. They've they've had doors open and opportunities open that they didn't have because of Title IX. And now the Biden administration this year has released proposed changes that would I believe undermine the intent of the original law. It no lo- women would no longer receive protection on the basis of sex as uh, Title IX was originally written and intended. Can you tell us about those regulation changes? Will we expect to see them push through, and what might the effects be? Sure. So the the regulations are lengthy, and there are you know many ways in which that I believe they are harmful. Um, to women and to education generally. But the short of it is that the statute uh, prohibits discrimination on the basis of sex. 
Sex is a biological term. Um, it refers to either male or female, as opposed to gender or gender identity, which which is more of an academic concept that has to do with social, um, you know, social construction of, of sex roles or identity. Um, so, but the statute doesn't deal with any of that. It, it, it protects discrimination on the basis of sex. And by the way, that means male or female, right? So mm -hmm. if a school is, I don't know, disciplining men uh, for something that it's not disciplining women for, they're discriminating against men. If a school is offering a women's studies course and not letting men take it, they are discriminating against men. Those things violate Title IX. Okay. Um, so, but anyway, so so the statute is is binary in nature. Um, what the and, and all federal anti discrimination law, you know, is is basically that way. Um, what the Biden administration is doing is saying that that phrase on the basis of sex actually includes gender, gender identity, gender expression, um, all these other things that clearly the statute wasn't thinking about when it was passed. So mm -hmm. if Congress wanted to, it could pass a law preventing discrimination on the basis of gender identity. Um, there have been several proposals to do just that, including the Equality Act. Um, those, those laws have not passed. They have, those bills haven't passed. They haven't become law. Um, they haven't been successful. So what the administration is doing is basically trying to get their way without going through the normal legislative process required by our constitution. And they're just reinterpreting the statute to achieve what politically they were unable, they've been unable to date to achieve. Um, and so they're saying that the statute prohibits discrimination on the basis of gender identity. And that means that biological males can self-identify into women's programs. Um, and let's be clear, identify just means just that, identify. You don't have to do anything. You don't have to suppress testosterone. You don't have to have, to have surgery. You don't have to change your name. It's a self-belief. Right. If you, identify, if you say that you identify as a woman, the Biden administration rules will allow biological males to live in female dorm rooms, use female locker rooms, try out for women's sports teams, um, win scholarships that were set aside for women, um, enter any space, you know, a rape crisis center on campus, any space that was designated for women is, will be open to those people. And, and not just that schools can allow that, um, they will be required to let biological males who identify as women use without, women's spaces. Without questioning. Without questioning. No them. questions asked. No, nothing. No, no medical records, no legal documents, just their word. I identify as a woman. You can come in. You take it. That's okay. So I also heard. Now, now, let me be clear. A lot of that's already happening, right? Yeah. And, and, we saw it with Leah Thomas in sports. We've we've seen it in restrooms and locker rooms and other things. Those things are happening because the schools are choosing to allow it. Okay, now what? Well, now the Biden administration is telling all schools, not you just that you allow. may allow Leah Thomas to swim. You have to allow Leah Thomas to swim. And if you don't, we're going to pull your federal funding. And you can be sued by Leah Thomas or whomever else for millions of dollars. So now it's a, now it's going to be a mandate. Now. Could you get in trouble for calling someone a male or a female? It's already happened. So so and even though these regulations don't yet have the force of law, um, schools are being told to follow them. And so in Wisconsin, uh, there was a public middle school that punished, that tried to punish, they opened a Title IX investigation into three, I believe it was three, 13 year old oh, boys yeah. who referred to another student as she when the student asked to be referred to as they. And this was Title IX applicability. 
the school said that the reason they had to investigate the boys was because of Title IX. There was a big public outcry. The boys' parents um, uh, retained counsel and the school backed off. But that is an example of how schools are saying Title IX requires us to do this. It doesn't, but why are they saying Title IX requires them to do it? Because the Biden administration, Department of Education, is telling them that. Okay, so the implications for this, for I mean, I see the broad stroke implications for this, but the implications for sports are that there won't be, we won't be able to have sex segregated sports and opportunities for women, correct? Right. The, the implications for sports is that biological males who say they identify as female um, can try out for, walk on to, be, be recruited for. Uh, spots on women's teams given scholarships, athletic scholarships that are supposed to be for women. So I did hear, I'm going to put one more uh, thing on this. I did hear that there's even a question about whether or not there's a legal reason why you would have to have sports for for men and women. Um, if you don't, I guess that would be gender equity, like even if you just talked about gender as being different from sex. But if there was a man, for instance, that didn't make the men's team, he could say, I am i don't have opportunity. Let me play on the women's team. I want this opportunity in college. Right. Okay. So so that's here's how that works. Under the Biden administration proposed regulations, if that person says, I identify as female, they have to let them try out for the women's team. However... The Biden administration has not explicitly said this, but the reasoning, the reason they give for that, if you actually, if courts actually apply it to the statute, it's going to, re- it's going to require schools to allow any man to try out for a women's team. And here's why. The, they're basing it on a, on a Supreme Court case called Bostock. And that case dealt with employment. It has nothing to do with school or sports. But, and in fact, the Supreme Court said this it doesn't apply to Title IX, um, but the Biden administration is saying it does. Now, the reasoning of that opinion is this. In that case, the court said, any time an employer hires or fires somebody on the basis of, of, of them being transgender, they are discriminating on the basis of sex because... They have to think about they, they can't they can't know know that somebody's transgender without knowing what their birth sex was. So if you know that their birth sex was female and now they're presenting as male and asking to be called a male and you fire them for that reason, you are you are firing them on the basis of sex because on the basis of their birth sex versus their new sex. Mm-hmm. That reasoning was really meant to apply not only just to employment, but really just to hiring and firing, not to accommodations like restrooms and stuff. Um, but the but but the Biden administration is extrapolating and applying that to Title IX. Now, if you take that reasoning that anytime you think about somebody's birth sex to deny them an opportunity, if you say that that's discrimination, well, anytime a male coach, any type of coach, any coach denies a male athlete an opportunity mm-hmm. to play on a women's team because of their birth sex, they're thinking about their birth sex. Mm-hmm. The, the court set up a but for analysis. So anytime the decision would be different, but for the birth sex, you're discriminating in the employment context. Well, a male lacrosse player who tries out for a women's team who does better at tryouts than all the women is only being kept off that team, but for they would be on the team, but for their birth sex. So if you're really going to apply the reasoning of that case to sports, ultimately, I guarantee you, some court is going to say you have to let that have to let them play. And here's how it's going to happen. Here's I I tell you, I I project here's how it's going to happen. My daughters play field hockey. In the United States, field hockey is predominantly a women's sport. In the international community, some of the best male athletes in the world play field hockey. International students come over to American colleges. 
In fact, in my daughter's Division I field hockey team, they have a practice player from another country. He's on the national team of his um, country in that sport, and he practices with them on their team. Now, that's great. They love him. He's part of the team. He makes them better. Um, he's sort of almost like an assistant coach. He's included in all the um, social aspects of the team. He gets the gear, but he doesn't travel with them. He doesn't go into the locker room. He doesn't get playing time from them. And it's not a scholarship school, but if it were a scholarship school, he, he wouldn't be able to get the scholarship. Yeah. For it. Now, mark my words, all that kid has to do is walk into the athletic director's office with a copy of the Bostock decision in one hand and a copy of the Biden regulations in another and demand playing time, they're they going to give them playing time. And if they don't, somebody's going to sue eventually and a court's going to go, you know what? Logically, you're right. They opened that gate. Okay. Gosh. <laughs> um, and so and the then women's sports is destroyed for biological females. Yep. As it is. All right. Well, so now I want to bring Mary into the discussion. Uh, Mary, thank you for joining us. You have such an interesting story and you included it in your biography, but I want to hear it from your words. I want to know the impact of Title IX on you directly and the group of women that uh, you were rowing with when you were a freshman at Yale. Tell us the story, how it exploded, what the results were, why you feel like Title IX was an important part of that or gave you all, you know, the the grounds to go forward confidently knowing what you were doing was the right thing. Please go ahead. Well, Kim, it's a, um, it's a story uh, that became far more important than in the moment. Uh, when, when I was a, a first year uh, student at Yale, I started rowing. And I came from a time when there were no sports for girls in my high school. Um, Title IX had just passed, but you know that hadn't really trickled down into opportunities yet at that level. Um, I went to Yale and said, "Okay, I'm I'm going to try rowing because I knew I couldn't be competitive on the tennis team <laughs> when I was going to school with other girls who had been coached and had you know tennis teams and had a lot more experience than I did." Mm -hmm. So. Um, I tried rowing, which is a sport that if you are focused and you work hard, you can you can develop um, skills, you know, more quickly. Basically, um, the situation there was that the boathouse is about a thirty-minute bus ride from the campus, and so every day we'd go meet at the gym, uh, all the the men and the women, and we'd get on the bus and we'd ride out to Derby, Connecticut, where the boathouse was. There were no shower or locker room facilities for the women at the boathouse, except for this very small trailer where basically we could change out of our clothes, our, you know, going to yeah. class clothes and into our workout clothes. After practice, we would get back on the bus and we would sit there and wait for the guys because they were showering and getting clean and putting dry clothes on. And then we would ride back to campus to get to the last dining hall that was open for dinner. The reality is, is that when we were in that situation, we were cold and wet. Um, oftentimes, you know, when you're rowing, there's river water that splashes up on you, you're sweating. And so several of us got sick and we had some very high level, elite level athletes on our team. Our captain, Chris Ernst, uh, and Ann Warner were both on the Red Rose crew in 1975, silver medal at the World Rowing Championships. They were on the Olympic team in 76. And, and so they were training for the 76 Olympics. It was, it was very clear that, you know, we didn't have adequate facilities. The university was aware of this. They had had conversations about plans, but basically nothing was happening. There was, you know, a zoning issue. There was, there was some reason why there was a barrier to this moving forward. So our captain, Chris Ernst, came up with this idea 
she and Ann Warner, that we were going to go have this little demonstration in front of the athletic director. So 19 of us met in the basement of the gym and we took off our regular clothes and we wrote Title IX on our bare chests and bare backs. We put our Yale Women's Crew sweats on and we marched up the five flights to the athletic director's office. Oh now, there was an, um, a reception room. So we all went in and the we asked the athletic director to come out. Um, she came out and Chris Ernst read a statement. Oh, the athletic director was a woman. The athletic director was a woman. That okay. wouldn't have stopped this, but, you know, as a, she was the athletic director for women. Oh, okay. So she came out and we stripped. And then Chris Ernst read our statement that started with, these are the bodies that Yale is exploiting. That was the opening of the statement. We okay. had a reporter and a photographer from the Yale Daily News with us who took a picture that has become iconic in my mind of Chris's back. And you can see Title IX written across her back and the athletic director standing in front of her with her arms folded and her head down, of course, not looking at us because she's got 19 naked <laughs> college athletes standing in front of her with Title IX across her chest and backs. So we read our statement. We put our sweats back on. We marched downstairs, got into our clothes, got on the bus, and went out to practice. Just like a normal day. Okay, so that... Uh so who took the picture again? There was a, we had a photographer from the Yale Daily News. Who came into the room. Yes. St stood in the back of the room and took picture, took pictures. And what was the, if, so then did it, how did the story break? Like how did anyone so, ever hear about it? So the Yale Daily News published a, an article about it. And then that was picked up by the New York Times and the International Herald Tribune. Okay. And that's, that's when things started to happen. And um, the university was embarrassed. Um, you know, I, I use this, I've, I've actually given one talk on this when I use this as an example of how leaders need to listen, mm -hmm. right? And they need to address inequities and injustices and, and, and take them seriously because we should never have had to do that. No. I mean, here I was at Yale University. I mean, one of the best institutions in the country, and this is how we were being treated. And was I going to say that that was okay, that we be treated this way? So it was really a kind of a no brainer from in my mind, in my decision process, yeah, we should go do this because I want my voice to be heard that I don't agree with this. Mm -hmm. This is not right. It's not okay. And we want you to address this because we should have facilities at the boathouse. And the point of those facilities was so that you didn't have to share the men's facilities. That you didn't have to, you were able to retain your dignity, your health, and not have to feel uncomfortable or um, what was the word? <laughs> exploited. I mean, yeah, we, uh, these are the bodies that Yale is exploiting. Mm -hmm. So um, after the story broke, basically, you know, there were alums calling up like, please, can you give those ladies a locker room, right? And, and, um, you know, donations, et cetera. And the short story is by the following spring, there was an addition built on the boathouse and we had a locker room. And we really, you know, at the time, I certainly didn't appreciate that this would be such an anchor event for the issue of equity in women's sports, in mm -hmm. particularly in college. It was just that we knew we were not being treated fairly. And we were at an institution that I felt honestly should have known better. And, and an right? institution well, that has we are again. <laughs> here, here, yes. And an institution that I believe, of course, had the money. Well, you would think they have the money. They, 
no, people aren't blind to when women are suffering this. I mean, it, you don't, you just, you choose to ignore it. But here we are again at that same institution where my daughter is now, you know, telling these girls they don't have a right to have a single sex locker room anymore, just as in this last year. So I do think it's a, it's fascinating that we've come full circle. I kind of feel like your story needs to be retold on a broader platform again, because I think we've lost sight of what happens when women don't have these spaces that give them the opportunity to not be exploited, to have their dignity intact and, and to be able to perform comfortably or have the opportunity to perform comfortably and at their best. I mean, giving you that locker room, put a woman, you specifically, in a situation where you could train for a future Olympia, Olympics and become an Olympian and open doors for your own career. And, yes. and develop leaders. Yes. You know, I, I feel very strongly, certainly for me, you know, rowing was just a tremendous opportunity for me. I came from a very lower middle class family. You know, my, both my parents worked all the years we were growing up. My dad seven days a week because he could get time and a half on Saturday, double time, you know, double pay on Sundays. And I had opportunities to travel and compete and do things that I would never have had the opportunity uh, to do had I not, you know, yeah. reached the level of competition that I did in rowing. And it was, it was those women on the team, right? That when you see another woman who can excel and achieve that level, then you start to believe that you can do it too. And listen, we were national champions when I was a senior. I mean, we had several of my teammates and classmates, Olympic and elite level athletes. So it's creating that environment that supports the development of that young woman to excel. And then all those lessons that you learn in sports that are so important, you know, discipline, teamwork, self-sacrifice, those things all translate into all aspects of your professional and personal life Absolutely. in later years. So, you know, sports is so fundamentally important for women, um, important for men as well. But, you know, we have to remember that girls and boys are socialized differently in our culture. And girls are socialized that we're all going to play nice in the sandbox and we're all going to play dolls and there's no winner and there's no loser. And boys are socialized that they're on a team and there's a quarterback and they take instructions and directions from the quarterback and they win and they lose and they learn how to do those things. Girls need to learn how to do those things too. And that's what sports gives them. Yeah. So it is so important that we preserve the opportunity for girls, young women, and women to be able to compete fairly because it's through that fair competition that they strive for excellence and they can achieve excellence. Absolutely. I do. I think there's an, when you speak about fair competition and preserving that for women, if we remove that aspect of sports for women, if you remove our access to it from, you know, the doors that Title IX has opened. And then if you remove the protection we have of fair competition and dignity and changing in, in locker rooms, uh, protection for feeling safe and secure and a chance to have a female only space where you are preparing yourself to perform optimally. We remove that fair competition. You're, we are we are completely undermining all of those other benefits that sports provides for women. So you have to ask yourself a fundamental question. And I think this is what Title IX showed women. You say, hey, I am deserving of respect and opportunity and fair treatment in society. And then when you put that into the sports, which was kind of the, from Jennifer and learning about the history, kind of a sidekick, something that opened up from Title IX. It wasn't an intention. But what we've learned is that when you give women the chance to, you know, seek out how to be the best, seek out competition, and you give them a chance at being treated fairly and viewing themselves as worthy of that, 
you get you open doors for a, a future life of success and uh, to be role models for other young women growing up. Um, yeah, for me, it all boils down to just the one question. Do you believe that women deserve fair treatment and respect or not? And uh, and that includes fair competition in sports. And there's only one there's only one avenue that you it's a yes or no question. And there's only one avenue you can take. You have to protect women on the basis of their sex um, in order to establish that. So I am super appreciative of both of you for coming. I would like to give you each a chance just to give some closing remarks or closing thoughts. And uh, thank you for being part of our legacy's first podcast. Do you want to go ahead and say anything, Mary or Jennifer? Um, Kim, I'll start. Um, I think at least this is me personally. I think that every individual needs to be respected and that we want the opportunity, certainly in my sport in rowing, for everyone to row. Yes. And so while, you know, the the concern is, is that for those of us that are speaking out, saying that a female, a biological female category needs to be protected, that somehow that means that I am opposed to individuals who self-identify with a gender that's different than their biological sex, that that's, that's incorrect. I actually support that those individuals need a, a different category because we have all kinds of categories in sports to make it fair. We have weight categories, we have age categories, for example. And so I want everyone to have the opportunity I want those opportunities to be based on fairness Mm -hmm. and it's critical that the biological female category be protected because there is no way to erase a physiologic male advantage, Mm -hmm. even with testosterone suppression. Okay. To make the competition fair. That's the bottom line. We need to protect and ensure fairness for biological women. And we need to create the opportunity for other individuals who are identifying separate from their their birth sex, their sex, so that they have an opportunity as well. But that opportunity cannot be at the expense of the women, the biological females having fair competition and and safety. I I agree a hundred percent with what's been said here. Um, And I think just to bring a a legal perspective back into it for a second, one of the problems we have, because I do think we all agree that, that we want everybody to be able to participate in sport. Um, One of the problems is that we talk the language of accommodation. We want to be able to accommodate people who are different or who don't fit neatly into a certain category. We want people to be able to play and gain the benefits from sport that, that we have or our daughters have. Um, but sort of the other side of this debate doesn't want to talk about it in terms of accommodation. They want to talk about it in terms of, of rights. And they argue that they have an unfettered right Mm. to participate in the category with which they identify. And if the law bends to in that direction, that right can only be granted on the backs of women. So somebody's right is going, it's a clash of rights, as we said before. Mm. Um, The only way to, to kind of crack this nut and, help all people to be able to participate is to to shift the language with which we talk about this and talk about this in terms of accommodation. Um, As long as we're talking about unfettered rights, it will always be a clash and somebody's rights will have to prevail over another person's rights. Um, But I yes. like that. How do we accommodate? That's the way I like to think How do about we accommodate? it. Um, so, all right. Well, thank you so much. I'm going to wrap it up and I appreciate all of your time. Thank you, Jennifer and Mary. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank Bye-bye. you, Kim.